So welcome everybody back again to uh, this afternoon uh, section. We will have two different sessions. So the first one is called Technologies of Knowledge and the second one Spaces of Knowledge. And you see we made a special arrangement here with uh, our speakers and also um, some experts who are um, sort of commenting the talks we uh, are about to hear now. And we also have this um, experimental setting which is supposed to look informal, but is somehow complex in a technical <laughs> organization. <laughs> so hopefully this will work and you will understand us nicely and uh, clearly. And I'm just going to um, start with um, a few words um, of our introduction. So as I said, the uh, thematic of this section, Technologies of Knowledge. We are interested, and also after the uh, talk we've heard from Fred Turner, which gave a brilliant start to this um, symposium today, we are interested in the relation of technology, design, and social transformation when it comes to the question of knowledge production. And again, we try to make um, a sort of um, yeah, comparative reading in a certain sense and um, try to sort of um, discuss and also problematize narratives on knowledge product production going back to the Bauhaus at the time and regarding to our time, so the Silicon Valley time, um, digital transformation area. And one thing that um, is very important in this debate is the idea or notions of progress. So this is something, uh, certainly a topic we are going to address. And also um, ideas about the new man. So we have heard in the talk of uh, Fred Turner that there ha has been a vision or different vision of the new man shaped through technology and by using technology. And again, we would like to ask the question, where we can see any difference um, regarding Bauhaus being located in the so-called first machine age, um, yeah, dealing with questions of um, mass industrialization, but also craft on the one hand, and sort of today witnessing a second machine age, and sort of really trying to discuss this um, field of tension between the digital and the analog, the physical and the virtual, from consumption to co-production. So we're just... Um, one specific focus is to question the role of art and design. So we do not only have artists and designers, but we do have um, some artists and designers here at the table. And questions we would like to um, pose is, how does technology challenge design today? How can technology be designed? Or also the question, how does technology design? Which actually this table is a perfect example that is designed uh, by and mediated through technology. And another question, as I said, is the question of progress. And here, one of the leading questions is whether this um, opposing or uh, image of um, progress being emancipatory on the one hand and preservation being reactive on the or reactionary on the one ha other hand, if that is still a suitable um, image for the discussion we have one a day, or whether we really need to de um, read that in a very um, different and yeah, maybe oppositionary way. Um, I'm shortly to, I'm going to present people sitting at this table. So we start here with uh, Morishin Aliari. I'm going to present you in more detail later. Uh, Jesko Feser, um, Juan Puseng, she's going to support us uh, with the technology issues. Then we have Shaina Anand, Denise Akira, Orit Halpern, Bernd Scherer, and Georg Brachliotis. And my name is uh, Claudia Marais. The idea is um, that we have um, four um, short um, input uh, referates from 15 to 20 minutes. And after we have like a moderated debate between people sitting on this table. And of course, you're also welcome to um, um, have questions and also um, join the discussion. Um, we will first uh, start with you, uh, Moroshin Aliari, and I'm going uh, to present you. I'm very happy that you could make it here today. Um, you are working as an artist, activist, and you say an occasional curator, um, born and raised in Iran and now um, living in New York. Um, you're currently an artist uh, in resident at iBeams, one year research residency in New York City, where you um, do research on uh, digital uh, colonialism and also the uh, aspect of refiguring. Um, uh, sort of using refiguring as an um, issue of feminism and also the uh, colonizing practice. And what is very really, um, specific for your work is using 3D scanners. So we have one 3D scanner here. Um, you have been 
um, very successful uh, with one of your work titled Material Speculation, ISIS, where you have been um, reconstructing um, ancient artifacts that have been destroyed by ISIS, uh, also with uh, 3D printing technology. And also um, a very uh, important piece of your work is the 3D Activist Cookbook you have published together in collaboration with Daniel Rourke, and which is also um, available online, so you can download, uh, download the PDF of this um, activist cookbook. And um, yes, we are very much um, looking forward having you here. And I'm not quite sure on how the presentation will be, but um, we try it out. And I just give you the floor. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? No? OK. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me to Project Bajas, um, Hakavi, and all of you for being here. I'm always excited about formats that are not just regular formats, um, although it can be complicated and challenging, but I think there's something about that. So um, yeah, thanks for making this happen. Um, OK, so before maybe I start, I'm going to um, hand out these pieces of paper. And not all of you are going to uh, get these, but it's just going to be random. But please um, kind of like look through them, read through them, and hopefully at some point in the middle of at the end of my talk, we'll, I will ask you to maybe talk about the project that you have in your hand. Very briefly, just tell us what it is. Um, this is from the 3D Additivist Cookbook, printed unfortunately in black and white um, because of troubles with color printers, but so it's not as sexy as the, print, as, as the book cookbook itself. But yeah, I'll show you that later on screen. Thank you. Um, yeah, we just have to stay to, you know, pages. So this one is a bit long. So maybe, yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay. So just, can I grab this from here? Oh. All right, two last ones. Thank you. And just, yeah, this is gonna... This is one, and then this is a separate one. Yeah. All right. So I'm not really focusing on digital colonialism or my current research today, but um, I'll be focusing on a project I worked on in the last uh, three years called Additivism, the 3D Additivist Manifesto and Cookbook. But before that, I kind of want to <coughs> talk about um, this relationship with activism, which a lot of my work is about political, um, social issues, um, you know, in relationship to Middle East or kind of in relationship to different struggles of like daily life, living in the US, let's say as an immigrant, etc. cetera. Um, but I'm also very interested in the coming together of these worlds of activism and art. This is one of my favorite quotes by um, Nina Simon. And in it, she talks about this, this artist's duty, and that's something that I always think about, and I think that notion of like feeling like you have a responsibility to talk about issues um, around you on a daily basis is something that I've taken very seriously in my practice for the last 10, 10 years. Um, part of it is perhaps growing up in, you know, in, let's say the Middle East, where you don't have the privilege of making fun art. So I think it really like comes from that notion of like there's not nothing else you can like really think about because po politics is so embedded in your daily life and your experience that without even a choice, like like so many of my other artists, uh, friends who are from Iran, you always reflect on these, these issues and notions around you. Um, so six years ago, I became fascinated with the 3D printer and also its potential as a tool for creative thinking and, and resistance, but also bound up with the 3D printer, I saw a series of um, bombastic techno features promises we were distrusting and dismissive of. The promise that the 3D printer would revolutionize manufacturing, becoming a miniature factory accessible to every home in the world. In 2014, I started a collaboration with artist uh, writer Daniel Rourke, who is based in London, in which we ask two main questions as a point of departure, which are the questions you see on the screen. What does a radical use of the 3D printer look like? 
and what is radicality in 2017? So for one year, uh, we worked on a text, a manifesto that was released in 2015 as a 10-minute video essay. If I have time, I'll show three minutes of it. But again, you can find this online on my website. Um, the manifesto blurs the boundaries between art, engineering, science fiction, and digital aesthetics. In the manifesto, we call for artists, activists, designers, scientists, critical engineers, to accelerate the 3D printer and other additivist technologies to their absolute limits and beyond into the realm of speculative, the provocation, and the weird. So in the tiny uh, incremental process of the 3D print head, we saw a metaphor for rethinking, remaking, and rebuilding. A metaphor that called for planetary actions, but a metaphor that started small, a metaphor that anyone and everyone was welcome to take part in. Um, so through this kind of thinking, we also came up with a term called additivism, which is a combination of the two words additive and activism. Again, additive meaning additive processes and technologies, uh, like a 3D printer or kneading or weaving can be an additive process versus, let's say, a laser cut, which is a subtractive process, and activism. Um, and for us, additivism became sort of a movement, a collective, a call to arms, and um, a way for us to really like gather a group of uh, thinkers um, around us that were artists, designers, etc., and rethink the use of this, this very technology. In the last uh, three years, I also have been doing a lot of uh, research on my own around the poetic relationship between plastic oil 3D printing and archiving. Uh, you, you mentioned the work that I did called the, uh, the Material Speculation ISIS, which I uh, did a reconstruction series of um, some of the artifacts that were destroyed by ISIS. But around this time, and this is where this like notion of dystopia, sort of like darker aesthetic came into like my um, perhaps research. I uh, was thinking about the relationship oil has to terror and capitalism, and also plastic as the most used material in 3D printing, right? Like it's, it's a material that gets used the most uh, when you use right, right now, right? It's like, a, I believe this is a PLA. Um, and also 3D printing as a poetic and political act, archiving and documenting as acts against the forgetting of memory and history. Around the same time, I was reading this book by Reza Negar Stani called Psychonopedia, Complicity with Anonymous Materials. If you don't know this book and if you're interested in sci-fi horror, I very much recommend it because there's not that many texts like this out there, which is specifically about Middle East, like sci-fi horror and Middle East. Um, in his book, Negar Stani uses horror science and theory fiction as a way to reflect on the Middle East, in his book, horror is used as a methodology to bring the contemporary world politics and the war on terror with the history and archaeologies of the Middle East and the earth itself. Negar Sani exposes the jihad and the act of terrorism as the one founded on the movement of crude oil, desert, and dust. Um, and this sort of kind of like the, the way that he connects this like idea of the old thirsty capitalist and the unwinnable war um, and the, the jihadists and the relationship to oil. So all these connections that he brings in together, I'm not doing justice really talking about this book. This is like a very small part of it. Um, became sort of like really interesting to me in terms of how um, I could use this notion of horror sci-fi and dystopia as a way to... Um, come to perhaps a more positive um, space with this notion of activating and activism. So um, in Daniel and I's collaboration, we sort of became these weird futurists of a sort, creating a manifesto for the 3D printer which illustrated an all-encompassing ridiculous apocalypse we were all implicated in. Rather than try and solve the problems we face as a planetary species, political and social problems which had been with us for millennia, a problems which came with new and shiny names like the Anthropocene, we wanted to question the very notion of the solution, asking both what problems we were looking to solve and also how the stories those problems came wrapped in were products of particular privileges, identities, and point of view. 
We were interested in the past and the present of a technology in the way that it might change the path of its future. How can we build worlds and platforms that are not the worlds of a Silicon Valley associated with predominantly uh, straight white men? How to find room and comfort in denormalizing de that very image, that very figure? Um, so in our manifesto, we call for people, for writers, makers, again, designers, thinkers, to draft as many bad behaviors as they could master. And we promise to collect the best together and produce a cookbook, which is, again, uh, you can see in some of these pages that uh, you were uh, uh, handed out. Um, so the cookbook contains recipes, um, small scale, uh, 3D printer, um, kind of like files that you can download, and it's in this format of a 3D PDF, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and for us, it kind of offered a certain position, a provocation, a mode of thinking we found essential to further and even surprise our vision of the impossible, to maintain this openness. We also found it necessary to interrupt our own process, which sort of came in the middle of making this work, when we, you know, we had submissions after we released the manifesto, um, uh, we had a call and then we had submissions from so many different people and we made selections of them, somewhere around 70 selections from um, the submissions we had. And some, some, uh, somewhere between that process, one day we were like sitting and like looking at the projects and reading about different things we had chosen. And then we realized that it's actually still obviously very Western and, and very white. Gender wise, it was very balanced, which was we were like surprised by. I was like, that's amazing. We don't have to like worry about that part. Um, but still it lacked a certain kind of like position that we, we felt necessary to bring in. So we um, asked two collectives, uh, a, a parody and brown tourage to sub-curate a section of the cookbook, which you can find um, kind of like in the middle of the book if you, if you download it. Um, to kind of wrap this up, since I have, um, I think, not much time left, um, so to bring back to Bauhaus and Silicon Valley and other future making, um, Kind of like maybe this is a good good image to uh, kind of pause and think about. So does anyone know about this Cody Cody Wilson, the, the Liberator project? No, anyone here? So yeah, maybe if I explain it, you will remember it. But um, this was like one of the stories that came out in 2013, and there was like a lot of buzz around it, um, which uh, the. Uh, Cody Wilson released a series of files where you could 3D print a gun, a 3D printed gun, right? That could potentially work. So there were a lot of responses to this and people were like, now what are we gonna do? Everyone can 3D print a gun, which is kind of crazy because like, if you understand how 3D printers work, it's, it's much easier to literally walk to Walmart in America and get a gun than like make that 3D printed gun work. Um, but, but just like notion of, first of all, when you don't know the limitation of technology and you just like think about its possibilities, it's always there's some notion of kind of like fear around it, right? Um, and at the same time, maybe what makes that kind of like position very like important to, to criticize and question is that as soon as you would say a 3D printer, a lot of people would ask about this. Have you heard about the 3D printed gun? Like, what do you think about it? So for us, it was very important to actually turn this around. Rather than thinking about radicality as something that is connected to violence, to think about how we can build other worlds and other futures and be provocative and radical, but not fall into the world of this like DIY kind of um, white man anarchist troublemakers, right? Um, so singularities, such as the iPhone, Facebook, uh, uh, Rapporteur, they promise to bring all people together, to give us access to all human knowledge at our fingertips. Or the electric automated car singularity, a promise to usher in a clean, pleasant world with robot taxi drivers and limitless time to enjoy ourselves on our very generous universal income. For YouTubians like Cody Wilson and his plastic armaments, or Elon Musk and his electric cars, um, and his vision to go to Mars. Their predictions and solutions necessarily post, po posit an ideal, calm, and flattened landscape outside of history. A place beyond real political factors of class, status and, uh, st status and power, where difference is presumed not to exist. 
and this or that technology will get us there, this like promise of us is problematic, without ever really defining who this us is, who's going to go to Mars or survive in this world. And that's, I talked about this very briefly in the other talk I gave, which um, is this notion of cozy catastrophism. So, um, kind of the end of, of this section. In our manifesto for the 3D printer, we created our own weird post-singularity landscape, littered with the plastic imaginaries soaked in a crude oil and dripping with surreal post-human despair. And we called for people to join us in creating this world and filling it yet higher with weird and horrific ideas. Ideas that might rapture reality, but not maybe for the better. We shared the futuristic imperative, but simultaneously we wanted to undermine it, not by calling attention to the grand and wonderful future which evaded us out there beyond the horizon, but by welcoming everyone to revel in the messy apocalypses that are taking place right now and always have been. To recognize and make strange the very complex web of time and space we carry with us and infects all our technologies. We call for more raptures, more stories, more singularities, plural. Um, so, I want to do this. We wanted to work with others to create other potentially more democratic futurisms, Afrofuturities, Gulf Futurities, queer Futurities, um, decolonized, de-westernized, post-racialized, post-humanized futurities. We wanted to recognize and build a community that would allow us to encourage existence at the messy edge of failed realities and unsolvable, ongoing crisis of the present. Something that could actually be optimistic and positive but also dystopian. And my rant recently has been that we should not live in the future of Elon Musk. Let's protest that future. That future is very limited to that ideology of everything that Elon Musk is about and stands for. And just to like, you know, talk about Burning Man a little bit, yes, let's also protest that and like not celebrate it. Because Burning Man is actually the symbol of very problem that is happening in art making and problem solving and being fun and, and you know, like in this happy world of like utopia. So um, yeah, that's, that's my talk. <laughs> do, we, do we have like two, two minutes for one person to just present something from the... Yes. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Can, does anyone want to present any of the cookbook things that I handed out? Just talk about what the project was. Somebody has to know. <laughs> <laughs> if I sit in your hand, I'm gonna force you. Yeah, there's one. Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. It will. Hello, hello. Okay, got me. Okay, so I think this is a recipe uh, of a peaceful warrior project. And I think there are just different recipes, as I understand it, of how to achieve this. As, for instance, decolonial self-care, we shall invoke the power of the sacred serpent and connect with our ancestral knowledge. The serpent as a symbol of fertility, rebirth, guardianship, poison or healing, vengeance and wisdom. There are uh, other recipes here, as I read it, that might also put you in the position of a peaceful warrior, as in comedic yoga, meditation, womb power, decolonial diet, radical self-love, and holistic healing. Okay. <laughs> Is that, did I yes. get that? Thank somehow? you so much. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, uh, yeah, please go and download the cookbook if you're interested and look through it. It's also in this uh, format of uh, 3D PDF where you can, you know, kind of like play around with these embedded models inside the PDF. You have to open it in Adobe Reader. If you don't, you can't see the models. Um, but this is what's actually getting printed, um, which is called the Webcam Obscura, um, and it's it's one project that it takes like 40 minutes to print, so we thought it would work out in the duration of the talk. And um, yeah, the idea is that you can print this, 
little thing and put it on your on your webcam uh, here so it's either like blurs the image based on they're like different files and different shapes uh, but it will blur the image kind of like an anti-surveillance uh, gesture and it's very simple and it's very quick and literally if you have access to whatever printer you can make this happen so um, yeah thank you thank you Okay, um, as announced, um, we are going to continue with the next input and um, we will have a shared discussion after the inputs. Um, the next speaker is um, Denisa Kira. Denisa is um, both a philosopher and a designer, which is a, a very exciting combination. She's experimenting with uh, various uh, creative strategies of public engagement in science and technology. Uh, including, uh, for example, blockchain technology, open science hardware, but also tarot cards, consumer genomics, and food. Um, Kira, Denisa Kira holds a master degree in philosophy from Charles University in Prague, and also completed a PhD dissertation on the performativity in language and computer codes. So she is very well uh, recognized for her ethnographic work, um, especially on hackerspaces and makerspaces. So this is really something you've been very much into. Um, she has served as an assistant professor at the National University of Singapore, was a visiting assistant professor at the Arizona State University, and is currently teaching at the Future Design Program at Prague College while living in Tel Aviv. So this is quite a bit of um, commuting to do. Uh, in the talk she's going to give today, um, she will show uh, interrelations between historical Bauhaus uh, craft practices and design practices and contemporary maker culture. And I'm looking very much forward to hearing your talk. So thank you for the invitation. And um, I use this opportunity to actually look into Bauhaus because I always know it existed. And I found out something interesting I'll share with you, basically. <laughs> And it led me to some unexpected places, as you see on my first slide. And basically, if there is a way to summarize our 20th century and also this topic about design between uh, Bauhaus and present, then there is this one sentence that I want to start uh, from Alice's Adventures. And it is, I like what I get is not the same thing as I get what I like. And this was voiced during the legendary Tea Party conversation on how to be polite and one important design issue, which is why is Raven like a writing desk? It hints at, or rather predicts, the deep uncertainties in the whole 20th century, whether our desires can meet our needs, words can match our meanings, uncertainty and struggle about how content relates to the media and how the material conditions of life relate to their social, political, and artistic expressions. So, um, I actually found an interesting connection between what we call design and some things we, we, we are obsessing over. And basically, this famous children's story simply anticipated the way we talk about consciousness, language, and society in psychoanalysis, structuralism, even Marxism. Um, that our desires simply never match our needs, that what we say is never what we mean in structuralism, that our moral su superego is in eternal conflict with the impulses and instincts of our it, and that the improvements of material life and conditions on Earth, or what Marx calls the base, uh, or the means of production, don't really uh, lead to the improvements in superstructures, like social consciousness and so on. Basically, we are still trying to respond to that March Hare's Tea Party riddle through various means, political, political economy, psychoanalysis, but also design. And that will be, I, I, I guess, my main thesis. In fact, the riddle that he poses about likes and needs um, is the reason for existence of design. And we prototype for exactly the same reason for which we lay down on the psychoanalytic couch or start a revolution. We try to understand, negotiate, and learn to live with our conflicting needs, desires, and transgressions. And that brings me to the most important prototype that for me was kind of um, 
revelation in terms of all the issues that we're dealing with prototypes from the Silicon Valley will resolve all the world problems to this DIY making hacker culture um, communities that I hang out where, um, as you can see also from my computer, you have to use a ThinkPad to, to be even part of it. So what Bauhaus did in the early 20th century is basically transforming all of us into Alice's being questioned in the same way as in that Tea Party, in which we have to respond to the same riddling contradictions, which I'll try to cover now. Um, the Marion Brand's teapot performs how good design actually shares some of the characteristics of Carol's riddles and Freudian jokes and dreams or the so-called catalogic, if you remember it, which was this attempt to reconcile the irre irreconcilable, contradictory, and paradoxical functions. In 1913 Interpretation of Dreams, Freud uses kettle, kettle joke to explain how dreams work. A man accused by his neighbor of having returned a kettle in a damaged condition offers three arguments. Um, he had returned the kettle undamaged. It was already damaged when he borrowed it and he had never borrowed it in the first place. So for me, Marion Brand's cattle um, performs that logic. It is the ultimate dream work that explains our obsession with Bauhaus also. It is an impossible object of desire that embodies our fantasy of having the cake and eating it. What, what do I see there? Um, it is these dichotomies the silver and ebony teapot. It's a luxury product that will serve the needs of, mass, of the masses with uh, some cheap reproductions. Um, it will offer um, a new way to drink the tea for the new man, I guess, through this, uh, by distilling a concentrated extract rather than using uh, tea leaves. It's a handmade and crafted object with the tiny hammer marks on some of it but celebrates the metal machine age mass production. Furthermore, its machine, like this machine mechanical reproduced object, should serve the industry needs, but also well, is an attempt to bring social justice to the masses of workers after the First World War. So groundbreaking design simply reconciles the irreconcilable, we can say when we look at this um, pot. Um, it, um, or kitchenware. It respects the structure of our desires that are always in conflict. It allows us to break the conventions while confirming their power. It opens a space for fantasy, involves our subconsciousness, fears and hopes, and triggers all symbolic systems in political struggle. I claim that Marion Brand's teapot is crucial for understanding our present involvement and importance of design and prototyping. And that this is a mad tea party started in the early 20th century when we all became Alice's in a design wonderland where nothing is what it seems to be and for good reason. We are all invited to explore and make maybe our own connection between the ravens, kitchen tables and whatever else. So um, I'll show some of how these Bauhaus paradoxes are still haunting us basically and I'll start basically showing that the history behind this Bauhaus model and product explains the present hopes and expectations beyond prototypes and startups, mass culture of IKEA, I use IKEA as an example, and the emerging trend of this DIY making, hacking, and so on. So the um, silver and ebony shapes of this futuristic kitchenware embodied the Bauhaus tensions that still haunts us between the minimalist and almost metaphysical search for universal and primary forms experimental and artistic exploration of new materials and constructivist and pragmatist insistence on machine-based industrial production serving, um, we can say now startups, but also the new men, the emancipated classes of workers. So um, I'll just start with this. These are some examples I tried to find from the original Bauhaus uh, uh, designers. So on one side, it was something prototypes in Bauhaus were something that will reform industry and explore new technologies. So here we have a typical um, quote on this. Uh, prototypes are speculative experiments in laboratory workshops that will create these models for productive implementation in factories. And I think in Fred's talk, we, uh, he mentioned a lot about, uh, about these inconsistencies and paradoxes in what, uh, what the prototype and what technology should serve. Then, of course, there is this idea that it's a, yeah? 
It's lower, was that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'll try. It was Fred sign, but I recognized it. <laughs> Thank you. Fred sign. Okay, yeah, I didn't <laughs> see you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so there are conflicting um, paradoxes in inher inherent in this uh, in these prototypes and in Bauhaus as such. This idea that prototypes should reform industry, the idea that it should serve the working man, that it should be like a mass-produced, cheap um, object, which even the Bauhaus people themselves were aware it not going to happen. Here is a nice quote from Hans Mayer. I was frightened when I saw the houses. I imagined how homeless people would stand here someday while the master artists were sunbathing on the roofs of their villas. Um, or I mix it. Anyway, and there is the third thing, which maybe is more interesting, most interesting for me. It was this idea that prototypes were bas basically means of philosophical and artistic research. And that's the preliminary courses by Eaton, Kandinsky, and Clay, which was this search for some primary forms, loss of forms, and, uh, and so on. Like, it was for me something between art and philosophy that, uh, that, that is uh, interesting in, in that. So what happened with these Bauhaus uh, paradoxes, which we see on that teapot between a luxury product, handmade product, and something serving the masses? It's, um, and, and how did they try to reconcile this idea between mass production, automation, uh, automation and the handmade authenticity and crafts? This idea of disruption with social utopia of participation, the minim minimalist, unique philosophical forms, and the industry needs. Um, also, this question, does this teapot really try to like, um, concentrate on our basic needs and make a product that will serve everyone, or it amplifies our needs, or what it actually does in terms of that needs and desires? And I'll just show a few examples where uh, what happened of, with this Bauhaus pot and how it still haunts us. One will be, of course, the Silicon Valley prototypes, then I'll show some IKEA stuff, and then the third one, the DIY maker hacker. Uh, return to these handmade, digitally fabricated <coughs> designs. So, as, uh, if you remember, Brett, uh, uh, Brent's teapot uh, was supposed to uh, use this concentrated extract rather than tea leaves. And you can see plenty of these examples of such like radical um, teapots today. This is the most famous one, if you remember the uh, Juicero company who would sell you these uh, bags of juices that you could open yourself and pour into a, into a glass, but of course you can also buy their $700 machines that would do that for, for you. So I, would cl I claim that basically what Silicon Valley did, it used this aspect of Bauhaus, this uh, idea of disruption, of changing what the man does or how you make tea or something. And actually I have even a nicer example uh, not only Juicero, but recently another company called Teforia went out of business. They were making this 1,000 uh, US dollars expensive brewing machine, which was internet connected tea machine that was also using the, um, the extracts. Uh, finally, uh, they spent like $12 million or even more, $20 million, which is still less than that famous Juicero sink. Um, uh, then uh, there is, so it not always goes wrong. They not always go out of business. Here is a nice example of something called terrain technology, which is also making tea or juices or something with the vacuum technology. So here is the description. It's a brewing technology that allows beverage artisans, so it's not just tea drinkers, <laughs> to extract the entire flavor profile, their flavor profiles from any loose le leaf tea and so on. And these people are actually very successful even if this teapot costs $13,000. So talk about this disruption and uh, creating like something that didn't exist, something like some form of a disruptive automation and, and uh, uh, mass production happening there. <laughs> I, maybe you're right. <laughs> Anyway, um, I actually also claim that what uh, the second, let's say, aspect of these Bauhaus prototypes, and I claim they were always in conflict, was this idea of creating tools or products for the masses, yeah? So that actually also happened. It's not just Silicon Valley. IKEA is a beautiful example of something I, I would call a Bauhaus theater. Basically, the Bauhaus aspirations to merge art and life by making useful, affordable, beautiful objects 
to embody that socialist utopia following the strictly defined relations between form and function leads directly to this teapot we can buy or all of us buy at IKEA, some form of a design communism that is leveling all classes into workers and worshippers of Kandinsky's and Eaton's forms. When you look at IKEA design, it's an, um, like a mass-produced embedded Bauhaus design. Uh, the thousands of IKEA customers that right now struggle somewhere on, the, on this world to assemble their furniture unknowingly perform that Bauhaus theater in which humans employ modular re rectangles, circles, and other shapes to fill, fulfill their basic needs and the socialist ideal of products serving the base. Um, and then, of course, this is the community I'm more familiar with and curious about. So, um, the IKEA consumers are followed by these uh, rather anarchistic kit makers, prototype adventurers at some of the numerous maker fairs, uh, maker spaces and hacker spaces that explore the niches and limits of our modern obsession with handmade and industrial products, minimalist design and social utopia. Um, they I feel like they're exploring some uncanny, maybe forbidden, or at least excessive and carnivalesque qualities of the human relations to materials and technologies. And I'll show you in a minute what I mean by that. I'll just mention some of these new kettles. There are people that want to talk to their kettle over Internet of Things type of uh, mobile interfaces or other interfaces. There are people that are putting it on the blockchain. So I don't know, while you're brewing your tea, you're also mining uh, some form of coins. And they're <laughs> all left like some are more like products, some are more open and allow you to really open your pot and make it um, aware in some weird, in some sense. But what I mean as the most extreme form of these uh, carnivalesque DIY mm -hmm. prototypes is maybe the toaster project, and I'm really sad it wasn't a teapot, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this fantastic artist basically used materials which he sourced from Britain to make his own real DIY uh, product on a level of the material that he needed and I think where it failed was he couldn't convince the botanical garden to let him cut the rubber tree so that's why there was a bit of this thing worked only for five seconds he couldn't isolate the wires but I think he got from some mining company uh, the material for the wires um, so I'm asking my question may, maybe it's like are they really re liberating these DIY prototypes in that complex story of conflicting needs and desires that we put into our objects and in design. So is the obsession with hacking and communicating with wirelessly connected teapots also, um, does it represent our anxiety about the future of IoT scenarios, blockchain, everything and so on? Is it the continuation of the artistic and philosophical Bauhaus research or its socialist agenda? and search for participation and empowerment of the users? Is it, is it like giving the means of production to the people once you give them the technology and all these prototypes? Is it maybe the revenge and return of the repressed, the handmade, messy, decorative objects of some techno-folk culture? Is it some form of revenge of the users against the industry and the designers? Um, these are the type of questions I'm interested also in my design practice because yes, I do some de some design and it's very messy. And how much time I have? I'll show some of my projects, uh, maybe. Minus two minutes. Minus yeah, two. Minus two okay, minutes, yeah. so the stuff I do, I'll just slowly. <laughs> That's fine. Uh -huh. This this is a typical project I would be involved in, and I'm interested on in that level of DIY making. This is the euro coin, if you didn't recognize it, and it's basically I turn this euro coin into a circuit. Uh, uh, euro coins are beautifully conductive, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a jewel thief circuit, which people that do electronics probably did. Um, and it's something that can squeeze what is left out of battery and turn it into something useful like turning on an LED. So I'm interested very much into circuits and DIY making. Okay. That's, it. That's it. Thank you very much. Mm. Are there any uh, immediate questions uh, for Denise Akira right now? I can't see her really good, but... No, I don't think so. Okay, then we proceed. So. Okay, our next speaker, uh, China Anand.
Shana, are you ready or about? Uh, I haven't tested sound, okay. but I think we should be okay. Yeah, we will, we will find out. So, Shana Nant um, is uh, known as a co-founder of CAMP, collaborative studio, um, artistic studio founded in 2007 in Mumbai, she, in India. Uh, she has been active uh, as an independent filmmaker, media artist uh, since 1981. Uh, in her work, she is, um, or her work is very much informed by the interest in media and information politics, and also by a critique of documentary form and processes. Um, you are part of um, different um, media and film uh, collective um, projects uh, in Mumbai, and also um, embracing um, a collaborative experimental pedagogy when it comes to employ technology and use technology with um, also working together with uh, local uh, people in local areas and uh, when we think about uh, technologies in your work so it's um, TV radio cable network um, also mostly inexpensive surveillance equipment that you use for the creation of um, as you say temporary communication zones and micro media landscapes uh, your work has been um, exhibited and also published widely, so I just mentioned a few recent exhibitions you participated. So it's the Skulptur Projekte Münster in 2017, the Documenta 13 and also 14, and the Biennale in Shanghai 2014 again. So we're looking very much forward uh, to your presentation, and I guess you will give an insight in the, also the work practices of CAMP. Thank you. So hello, I, this morning I trolled through my computer and found some anchoring images for this new man and his extensions. And here's what I got. Um, man with the movie camera, 1929 Zigaberto, but also Elizaveta Svetlova, his wife who edits it. This is of course the same year Laszlo Moholy Naj expounds the future needs a whole man. And I'll just read from the Kino Eye Manifesto, that which the eye doesn't see, as the microscope and telescope of time, as the negative of time, as a possibility of seeing without limits and distances, as a remote control of movie cameras, as tele-eye, as x-ray eye, through all methods and means that might serve to reveal and show the truth, through the means and possibilities of film eye, towards Kino Pravda or film truth. And here is uh, Powers of Ten, Charles and Ray Eames, um, oops, 1977. And here are iris scans of civilians in Iraq, um, 2004. So we have man, we have powers, and we have military. Anyway, there's man, power, and military. So I've set myself up with the intention of speaking from practice, which I realize now is quite challenging given that it is about the medium of moving images and I have only 20 minutes. So you will have to pardon my peremptory tone as I try to illustrate some of the settings and processes, or you could say ethos, both in the sense of character or ethics or a way of doing, but also in the sense of ethos as a noun, the dwelling or habitual space or abode for our practice. But let me first begin with this ludic image of this game I play with my kid all the time, Jan Ken Pawn or Rock, Paper, Scissors. It's a game about the interplay of forces. Now, in documentary terms, let's give the rock the character of the technology or the camera, and let's give the paper the open palm, let's make her the subject, and let's make the scissors the author or the director. You can back, go back here for a minute to see the somewhat default forces at play, right, between subject, uh, technology, and the author. The forces are similarly aligned in ethnographic documentary practice. The camera shoots, the author or director calls the shots and yells cuts, and the subject becomes 
the open palm, ever yielding, full of grace, generous, letting you in, capture my soul, so on, so on forth. Now, this was a disturbing situation for me as a young filmmaker. How could I not technically and formally challenge the positions of the technological apparatus or my own authorial privileges? In truth, the subjects, authors, and technologies all have unique properties and could be thought of as equally powerful and equally fragile. Their roles could also devolve or they could exchange places so that what is produced is a modified landscape and epistemo epistemology, an activated blind field, be it discursively, psychologically, symbolically, physically, or otherwise. <laughs> So these were a series of neighborhood conversations that took place in New Delhi in 2006. Household TV sets were coupled with CCTV cameras and cable TV equipment and microphones and were connected to each other via meters of cables. Um, at this time, there was no internet or computers in this neighborhood, but RF modulators, signal splitters, coax cables and electric cables formed dense overhead matrices, porous environments you could parasite or emulate. And that static CCTV camera had just entered our market. Um, sorry, I'm going to be very brutal with the videos, but otherwise I won't uh, get to the end. Um, so here's the wiring diagram for um, uh, these series of conversations, and there were several we did with, with various um, um, uh, sets of groups and, and, and constituencies. Um, so you can see that the camera, that mini DV camera with its like screen sticking out, actually has its lens cap on. Uh, it's not recording. Um, so the lens no longer frames or contains the subject. The lens cap is closed. The DV camera is merely an analog recording device. And the crosshair grid, um, um, which we actually use to compose and frame um, and aim at an image, uh, splits and combines fields. And then the household TV set becomes, becomes spaces of production. This generative image is, of course, returned to sight at the very time of production, and of course, from here on, circulates in many worlds, right? Universally on the internet, in art shows, um, and in the neighborhood on, on um, DVDs and VCDs. Um, here's another man, the big brother. Now, Orwell wrote 1984 in 1948 in London. And in 1984, Apple launched its Macintosh PC in Silicon Valley, and the ad said, 1984 won't be like 1984. <laughs> These are clips from two film adaptations, both made in 1956. Anyhow, on one of my many travels to London, made possible only after 10 fingerprints and two iris scans. Now, this is something I have done almost every year since 2003. Biometric visas were introduced by the UK at the same time Iraqi civilians were being iris scanned between 2003 and 4. But the bizarre thing is each time I need a UK visa, and I have 13 since 2003, I need 10 fingerprints and two iris scans. Anyway, on this particular trip, we decided to enter the black boxes of CCTV control rooms. Now, despite the invasive processes of getting past border control in the UK and almost always feeling like I was somehow transgressing norms while merely walking down a UK high street, all the while self-profiling my South Asian self, I did have certain privileges as an, as an artist. So I tell the curator and she says, ah, a contemporary art project. You want to spend time in a control room, one that does open street, street surveillance. Well, let's try to get you in. We got permission, 
and then in turn opened up the control room as a clinic to members of the public, 40 of whom, sorry, and in turn opened up the control room to members of the public, 40 of whom came in to see where those cables hardwired into their build environment led to, what their street view looked like from inside the second life box, and what life was like for the workers there. And why, if all this was seen, could be seen, no one came to help when they were mugged or held at gunpoint. Oh, and the but. 10 years up and I've never known anyone to ask it. And of course, this material circulates again. Here it is in a prison in um, Nottingham. And um, at this, during the same trip, we also enter the largest mall in Europe. It was built on the site of the largest IRA bombing in the UK, a footprint that included Exchange Square, Market Street, you know, the industrial, first industrial city in the world, across from which, across from which was the library, the Cheatham Library, where Marx and Engels wrote um, the manifesto. In the mall in Manchester, uh, wrote the, the Communist Manifesto. So this is a mall in Manchester, the largest in Europe. Um, inside it, close to 100 people signed image release forms that concatenated provisions from the UK Data Protection Act, which has um, a section for rights of individuals, uh, which basically allows you access to your images if you feel you're being untowardly watched. Um, so the image release form that these 100 people sign has these provisions mixed into the standard documentary um, image release form. Um, these were handed over at the end of these two days en masse to the authorities in the mall, which in turn released the footage from the 206 cameras to us. So it was somewhat of a successful public art prank. And Capital Circus here is a film made from that material. It's released, it's given back to everyone who signs the form, and then, um, yeah, the footage floats and survives, but we also then craft uh, something from it. My friend, Sebastian Lotkert, who's sitting here somewhere, first used the term privileged escalation at the Summit for Non-Aligned Educational Initiatives held here at the How in Berlin in 2007. Of course, he was taking from a hacker term, privilege escalation is the act of exploiting a bug design flaw or configuration oversight in an operating system or software application to gain elevated access to resources that are normally protected from an application or user. And I really, it somehow formed another ethos of the way we work. And I continue to pirate this privilege escalation from Sebastian because we do have privileges as artists and how should we escalate them, but importantly in turn, how can we redistribute these privileges forms another kind of basis of our practice. So here is the image release form, one of many that, um, sorry, this is not my computer, so I'm not used to the slides switching and it's in French, so. Uh, uh, here it is, is um, um, an image release form. And this is the privilege escalation um, cycle. So um, it kind of towards what end, I think, is, 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 is the important question here. Now, the CCTV operators in the control room worked long hours at low wages, bound by rules and law that will never let them transgress into a love for watching or filmmaking. But nearby, in a World War II bunker, so also in, in, in England, on the English Channel, a voluntary coast guard watches over the busiest part of the English Channel. David Cameron, in his austerity measures, had announced big society. You know, when the state reneges from its functions, such as health and education, and expects a civil society to chip in, volunteer, and do what the state does. But do it yourself, do it with others, and do it better. Right? It's a really perverse situation. So for a year in this moment of big society being like bandied about, these volunteer coast guards took to filming the sea through their telescope exploiting their love for watching and their love for the sea, feeling out their relationships between things near and far. Gurkhas on the hill, sailboats and ferries, um, 
submarines and warships, fishing quotas, EU quotas, France, and so on. This became the country of the blind and other stories, um, a series of, 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 of films made with the Coast Watchers, of course, returned to the site in the bunker itself first. It played there for a year before traveling to find its own roots. Meanwhile, in, intrigued by that seamless switching of 206 cameras and matched cut continuity that was going on in the mall, um, and all of that happening from like one joystick keypad, I wondered what we could do with just one of those PTZ cameras, Pantel, Zoom, SD video, cheap cameras. I purchased one 300 euro CCTV camera and controller on Edgware Road in London, got a separate passport for travel to Israel, and flew into Tel Aviv. I went in with ease. The young security guard at the airport smiled and said something about VJing here. Anyway, on the way out, I was rated six enemy of the state. <laughs> but before going to Jerusalem and before going to Palestine, I'd kind of presented myself with three questions, right? These are uh, dilemmas um, and sort of questions you stay with, you grapple with, and from it kind of emerges some, some clarity. And I told myself, do you really want to be the 1,209th filmmaker or artist going to Palestine because you feel you have a genuine political stand to espouse and share via your work? And I thought about it. I'm like, really? Yes, I do want to go, and I do feel this. So if you say yes, and you decide to stay with the trouble, so to speak, then uh, and all the representational dilemmas you come with it. Then you ask the second question, but I want to make this film completely autonomously. I want to not avow or acknowledge the State of Israel for any permissions in, in, in this process. Um, so how would you do it? And lastly, I want to make the one, experience I don't want to make it a sort of Pallywoodized victim narrative, which is wont to happen often in Palestine, because the victim narrative is entrenched so deeply in the psyche of people who live in a permanent state of exception. We have this problem with doing ethnographic filmmaking in India as well, right, with endemic poverty. Uh, and then you turn on a camera, and you let the subaltern speak, but then the subaltern will just speak about the violence and the strife. And there is nothing transformative in that, and you produce something that you already know. And of course, there's a certain violence in that image-making practice. So how do you make it somewhat of a transformative experience for the subjects themselves, who in turn, turn can turn their witness testimonies into landscape geographies? Um, so that's what um, happened in, in, in this uh, uh, process, you saw the dome camera, one PTZ, which was housed in a little wooden box, and uh, the, the cable and the controller were sent into the safety and privacy of their homes. Like in Kirkia, they were watching the image on their tellies. Um, in the case of some families who were evicted, of course, we were camping out on the road in protest doing, doing the work. Um, but they were controlling the image, seeking near and far. Um, objects and uh, speaking live or over it. Um, so again, there are stages in these processes, right? In this reconfiguring of subject, author, technology. Uh, in the second stage, it's footage, it's, uh, it's the editing, and then in the third stage, it's sort of audience, the screen, and, and, and again, the authorship comes, comes back into play. Um, how much time do I have? No, 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 I'm 17. I've got a clock here. Three more minutes. So most recently, um, and I'll skip through this maybe and get, get somewhere else, um, we planted one of those PTZ cameras on top of a cell phone tower, which was on the roof of uh, the largest mall in Bombay. Uh, this mall is called Phoenix Malls and was um, Phoenix Mills, right? You change one alphabet and the kind of Manchester story again, but the, the, uh, 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 it was the first mill to be uh, murdered when, with the closure of mills and just transforming of the post-industrial cityscape in Bombay in the late 80s. Um, we send the feed into the IMAX auditorium. 
and um, um, kind of perform a 200-year history of the city told from this single point of view, because really you were in the center of the city and could uh, bring in uh, you know, spatially and temporally quite a bit and kind of bring it back to site, the very site of that land grab and in its own uh, cheeky way bring this camera obscura back into the cinema hall as it was in a pre-cinema pre time and of course taking a somewhat side sweep at, at VR. Um, so yeah, that's um, that project and I want to just um, divert to one, I have two minutes, right? <laughs> I'll be quick. Um, this is a project that also began in Berlin in 2007 over conversations um, as we went to the G8 at Rostock and then went to Bombay with uh, uh, my colleagues here in, 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 in Berlin, Jan and Sebastian, um, and uh, sort of asked ourselves, what do you do with, at this you know, cinema at the time of more cameras than people? There is all this footage. And no longer are these old cutting, you know, old metaphors of film that say it fell on the cutting floor, it's no good. We know for a Kawana documentary you have 199 hours of footage you don't use. So that's where uh, Padma was born public access digital media archive. I'm not sure I have too much time to go into these things, but um, it's a long collaboration. It will be 10 years old now. The archive grows. It's deeply uh, text searchable. You, have, you can feature edits. You can edit online. It's densely annotated. And then we have an allied cinema archive. Um, you have cut detection. You have different ways of... of, of uh, um, seeing the image, it's very much in that sense, since I'm not a design person here, now I can say a design project that had a lot of thinking going through it from, you know, from the kernel to the code to um, um, what it means to share video online and what it means to then let it, you know, let, let it go, set it free and let it be used um, uh, differently. So, yeah, I'll stop there. Are there any immediate questions for Shaina? I don't see anything. No. Okay, so then we come to our um, last input by Orit Halpern. Um, very much looking forward to having you here. Uh, Orit uh, Halpern is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at uh, Concordia University in Montreal. And there she is also the director of a cluster called Speculative Life. Uh, this cluster is part of a bigger research cluster in art, design, and technology called Milieu, which is also situated at uh, Concordia University. And it's a very nice place, so if you have the chance to go, it's really worse. Uh, Orit is um, particularly uh, focusing in her research on the history of big data, interactivity, and ubiquitous computing. So her latest book is uh, called Beautiful Data, A History of Vision and Reason Since 1945. It has uh, been published by Duke University Press in 2014. And basically uh, in the book she is um, sort of um, providing a genealogy of interactivity, the interface and big data, starting from cybernetic as a very interdisciplinary field of knowledge and knowledge production. And she tries to link together different narrative and strands coming from design, architecture, artistic praxis on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, um, discourses from on life, humans, and social sciences, and tries to show how uh, in this uh, topic of data, big data, beautiful data, we sort of um, Rene uh, yeah, sort of reinvent our relationship, our pre-modern relationship uh, and our obsession with storage, visualization and the archive. So in some kind it's also revisiting history of archives and um, representation and memory system through the lens of cybernetic and big data. 
So, um, Oris, besides um, working on big data, she has many more uh, very interesting research topics. She's working on smartness, smart cities, and something she calls the smart mandate, which she's not going to present today. <laughs> so well, no, I'm going to present part of it. Okay, part of it. So. <laughs> not all of it. Okay. And also she's uh, um, working on resilience uh, and the question on design and crisis, so how design uh, also um, helps um, sort of um, to a normalization of crisis and uh, what uh, resilience, what role resilience play within this relation. So very much looking forward uh, to your input. Thank you, Claudia, for that really generous introduction. And thank you, Joanna and Hakeve, um, and all of you for sitting through this. Um, so I'm going to go really fast, but um, don't yeah. ask me to slow down. Uh, uh, but it's a, it's a mimetic reperformance of our current Anthropocenic condition, I guess. So um, the Anthropocene confronts us with new questions about both technology and what constitutes design as well as method. And today we'll talk about some of the technologies and imaginaries that are um, terraforming, perhaps redesigning our planet. And I want to talk about something I'm calling resilient hope. Um, and I'm going to go through a lot of sites where I work, but also um, that highlight some of the themes that um, I want to talk about. So from the tailings of large open pit mines, and the omnipresent data centers with their seeming infinitude of data, to the over-concentration of capital in the hands of a few, we appear to be in an age of dense accumulation, feeling the weight of what once seemed so light. The internet and information has become concrete, literally utilizing the sand and metals of our earth to transmit its data in a matter not so different than constructing roads and buildings. So much weight makes us dream of being plastic and light, mobile, modulatory, capable of bearing all these materialities while continuing to sustain the technical and economic fantasies of eternal growth and novel change. It is perhaps of little surprise then that since the 1970s, it is the word and the concept of resilience that has become the figure of hope for planners, entrepreneurs, designers, policymakers, and environmentalists, to name but a few, alike. Resilience is a system's ability to absorb shock and continue functioning. The 1970s marked the rise of another myth reality, something I want to think about as a design, that of finance capital and derivatives. The derivative pricing equation, the black school's derivative pricing, has a lot of nature in it. Um, it's basically a random walk merged with a normal curve um, that lets you adjust time to bet on uncertainty. Finance is often presumed, unlike all the rest of things, to be feather light and mobile. It's understood basically as money making money. As the recent 2008 crisis demonstrated, however, nothing is further from the truth. Derivatives are financial instruments that allow a certain amount of something, mortgages, furniture, whatever, to be traded at some point in the future at an agreed upon price. One can also, for example, also bet on the cancellation of an order or some other event changing the future price of the underlying commodity or security. In fact, you can even bet futures against futures. The result is that the size of the derivative markets far overshadows the world's actual gross domestic product, by now exceeding the world's GDP by 20 times. These markets have grown exponentially by 25% over the last 25 years. What then is the relationship between speculation and resilience and extraction? I want to discuss then how does it shape how we design futures, but also what place does design have in shaping um, this relationship. These questions emerged quite viscerally in the course of doing field work on the topic of logistics and smart cities. So I've worked a lot here at Songdo. Um, I became concerned with the forms of speculation and hope that continue to facilitate the ongoing penetration of computation, both in terms of smart cities, grids, logistical systems, even mines, which I spend a lot of time in these days and um, finance, of course, and how this, the ongoing, these all, uh, there's so much of penetration, if you will, of computation into the planet. And what interests me, so what interests me is how we're pessimistically computationally optimistic. Um, and uh, just as these ads demonstrate, uh, so on one hand, um, we understand smartness to be green, 
and behind this kind of image and marketing is the concept of climate change, of course, and the sort of potentially devastating future that these cities will save us from, and how this sustainability and even resilience is accompanied with a fantasy of ubiquitous computing and eternal economic growth, so that we have a new equation. And by the way, I love making little equations. It's part of my method. Bandwidth equals resilience equals life. So yes, bits per minute over some fiber optic table has now become life itself. Coming to it, so we have this new little secondary ex, um, equation: extraction plus resilience, usually equated with smartness, plus some good speculation equals hopefulness. Yes, <laughs> the end of the world has never looked so good. So um, <laughs> it's sad but true. But what's interesting, and just to explain how this hopefulness works. So um, if you take, so what's interesting is despite all the doom and gloom, the end never seems to actually arrive. So back here at Songdo, which is actually heavily leveraged, totally debt ridden, under sea level, when I asked about what was gonna happen to this, the Cisco engineers responded to me, it's just a test ground, a prototype, experimental, repeatable, we'll just build the next version in Malaysia. Great, therefore this city sort of replicating the structure, if you will, of the very derivative pricing equations, which already, of course, course, um, uh, um, uh, finance this. So we have this nice new little um, pro process where we swap, derive, circulate, demo, prototype, and version as we also swap as, as we circulate a capital. So I'm going to focus on three operations today, hoping, demoing, and deriving that I think kind of substantiate this resilient hopefulness. Um, and so just to begin, I'm going to use two case studies from my work, one from India and one from New York, just to kind of il illustrate this, but I think um, there's a lot more. So let's start with some hoping and extracting. This is um, in, the, in May of uh, 2016, I went to uh, West Bengal to investigate both urban development in Kolkata and how Chinese capital is reformulating territory. One site I visited was the city of Shilaguri, which you're watching right here, located on the floodplains of the Himalayas. And what you're actually watching is bouldering, uh, is the removal of boulders and sand from riverbeds and to use for concrete to fuel the incredible real estate boom. So this is 600 kilometers south in Kolkata. It's Rajarat 5. It was supposed to be designated a smart city. India's really into those these days. Um, but it never really finally got the designation. And it's mostly um, abandoned condos without any infrastructure, neither water, nor often not even the fiber optic cable hookup. Um, this rapid speculation emanates from the fact that most of these developments, both office parks and residential towers, are heavily leveraged, in this case um, by the former Morgan Stanley real estate. Long before ground was even broken, both the debt and cost to the state and developers had likely been credit swapped with profits reaped by the large investment banks located in the global financial hubs of Mumbai, New York, Frankfurt, and London. And this is a pattern that is repeated throughout the subcontinent, in fact, throughout the world. And while the functions of such zones as Rajarat are on beyond financial financialization is unclear, their development has, as a result of complex and entangled histories of caste, colonialism, and capitalism, already cost some 30,000 people to be dispossessed from their home, and they end up in these um, informal developments or uh, working under these condi deplorable conditions in places like the Kolkata port. And this is not particularly unusual, uh, globally speaking. However, mirroring these scenes of graphic territorial scale violence are another set of marketing, technological, and logistical endeavors that take part in a positive speculation on precarity and environmental destruction. So speaking of liquid and ever greater hopefulness, and rising waters in particular, let's recall the recent economic crisis of 2008. And not long after, in one of the more astounding recent demonstrations of hopeful speculation, um, MoMA ran the Rising Currents exhibit uh, uh, in 2010, ironically, just before the real hurricane Sandy hit. And one of the most popular projects exhibited is the one you're seeing, which is Oyster Texture by Karloff Scape, a project that has gone on to be funded to the tune of $60 million. The project is now sited at Brooklyn's Gowanus Canal and proposes to grow oyster reefs as ecological barriers, nature, I guess, against nature. Um, 
nature meaning in apostrophes, of course. Uh, the very recruitment of our and other organisms' bodies for and as infrastructure poses, of course, historically situated questions about what makes this new mode of managing speculations, populations, and futurity novel, and how these forms of speculation are related to the discourse of resilience. In this case, designers are making Manhattan resilient. The irony is that in serving as infrastructures, the oysters would slowly die off as a result of their dirty and inhospitable environments with rising water acidity as a result of the CO2 um, and temperature. This death, however, is beautifully rendered by the architects, um, embracing not only the terminal destruction of New York as aesthetically pleasing, but also, um, of course, inevitable. And the uh, discourse is resolutely and abundantly positive. MoMA and PS1 joined forces to address one of the urgent challenges facing the nation's largest city, sea level rise resulting from global climate change. Although the national debate on infrastructure is focused on shovel-ready projects, we now have an important opportunity to foster new research and fresh thinking about the use of New York City's harbor and coastline. As in past economic re recessions, construction has slowed dramatically, and much of the city's remarkable pool of architectural talent is available to focus on innovation which is to say they're unemployed. <laughs> That's great. Um, anyway, another project in the same exhibit, New Acrea City by N Architects, repeats this theme of destruction made visible and aesthetically pleasing with a proposal for new zoning strategies and the literal use of bottom-up strat uh, design strategies such as placing flotation devices on the bottom of buildings and seawalls. The video depicts this storm surge in our survival and architectural intervention as a solution. As the waters rise, new real estate and agricultural opportunities are offered. When the big storm finally hits, as you're about to see, um, we see, this is wonderful, this is my favorite part. Here comes the surge, we grow some food first, <laughs> we get the surge, everyone gets on the top of the roof and they're calmly evacuated by a helicopter. It looks wonderful. <laughs> um, the light is gentle, there's no wind or rain, it all looks rather pleasant. These images resemble, of course, nothing um, of the devastated environment that has current, and if one is thinking about Houston or Puerto Rico or the past Hurricane Katrina, in light of such reference, one cannot help but wonder who's being left behind. So there's a kind of aesthetic, right, a design aesthetic that's going around in this lust for ruins. So I want to talk about the second phase of this, which is kind of, so what ties these things together on one hand is obviously finance, but on the other hand there's a notion of ecology and environment that substantiates these, uh, these ideas. Um, so resilience is a particular logic. It's not about a future that's better, but rather about an ecology that can absorb constant shock while maintaining its functionality and organization. So I'm following the work of Bruce Braun and Stephanie Wakefield here. It's a state of permanent management without ideas of progress, change, or improvement. We can think about that in terms of the forms of uh, solutions that design are currently positioning. The understanding of resilience is most crucial historically to my discussion and to large-scale planning projects and contemporary discourse was first forged in ecology discourse during the 70s, especially in the work of C.S. Halling, who established a key distinction between stability and resilience. So working from a systems perspective and interested in the question of how humans could best manage elements of the ecosystem that were of commercial interest, like salmon, wood, et cetera, that's kind of what he was into, Holling developed the concept of resilience actually as a critique of, of, of the current, of most capitalist modes of um, management by arguing basically um, that the critique is that the premise was the ecosystems were most healthy when they returned to an equilibrium state after being disturbed or treated ecosystems as homeostatic. Um, Holling uh, called the return to a state of equilibrium stability, but argued that stable systems were often unable to compensate for significant and swift environmental changes, and that in fact resilience does not equal stability, um, and that we can't really think of systems as constantly returning to the same state, but that they still might be able to maintain the same, um, um, their, their operability. In short, hauling art, that stability is often the, res the re inverse of resilience, so we have to think of this as a chance-filled thing. Resilient systems might have multiple states that could change while still maintaining vital processes. 
instead of worrying about preserving individual animals or lives, then resilience managers should concentrate on preserving vital processes. So operability is critical. A fact that's not clear when you look at strategies to preserve, for example, vital system security, for example, in homeland security, when examining the new line of resilience planning. So here's just an example. This is uh, New York finally during the real Hurricane Sandy. Um, and do you know what that one gleaming building is? Goldman Sachs, of course. <laughs> Somebody did their resilience planning. Um, so, uh, so the important thing is, <laughs> the important thing is that New York might go down, but Goldman Sachs will not. So the operability of the system is maintained. But it's also um, so hauling the seams. <laughs> so hauling assumes that uh, not only is change is constant, um, but of course. Um, he underscores also an epistemological change. We're here about knowledge. How do we act under conditions of uncertainty? And of what he's espousing, he says, flowing from this assumption of resilience would be not the presumption of sufficient knowledge, but the recognition of our ignorance, not the assumption that future events are expected, but they will be unexpected. So we have this new kind of paradigm around ignorance as a virtue. Donald Rumsfeld perhaps said it best, there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, there are unknown unknowns, and today we just assume we just don't know. <laughs> Contemporary planning and finance and design practice abstract the concept of resilience from an ecological systems approach and transform it into epistemology and value, therefore the constant deming, swapping, uh, deriving, hedging that we engage with. These fields posit resilience as a general strategy for managing uncertainty without endpoint. Resilience also functions in the planning and management to collapse the distinction between emergence and emergency. Nowhere is this better exemplified than the aforementioned examples of New York City, where after the slogan of the devastation of Hurricane Sandy in 2012 is fix and fortify, a clear statement of the stance of urban planners towards geoecological trauma could perhaps not be found. Planning it as post must assume and assimilate future unknowable shocks ones that may come in any form, including threats to security, economy, or environment, and, obvious, and often we really don't differentiate. Which brings us to the demoing part. How do we get out of all this trouble? Such logics pervade the landscape of large logistical and computational environments. So returning to the example of Songdo, um, uh, the, the, uh, the the pre every present state, as I mentioned, of the smart city is understood as simply a demo or prototype of a future smart city, right? A testing ground, an example, prototype, repeatable. Um, as a consequence, there's never a finished product, right? There is no such thing as failure. You almost can't fail. Um, you can just keep deriving, I guess. <laughs> um, but rather, um, so this, there's always a this is always just a preliminary version of another one of these cities around the globe repeating this kind of process. This idea of infrastructure itself as a demo or test bed, a planetary test, to use Richard Neutra's 1943 terms, avoids any actual questions of whether this construction impacts the planet, labor, or its inhabitants, and opens the door to assimilate any difficulty or challenge into the next version just by way of deferral. This de design logic allows the management and negotiation of risk through derivation from an imagined origin in a manner that avoids ever having to finally encounter or take responsibility for the impact of respective events, whether, whether economic or security on the world. Um, which brings us back to Songdo and to the relationship between derivation and um, uh, resilience. So to come to the final of our um, operations, if you will. The concept of resilience is married, therefore, with the concept of a future that is always a version, perhaps a derivative replica of another moment, thus allowing us to both always take shock and uncertainty while at the same time never actually have to deal with the consequences. No staying with the trouble here. Um, so what, how does this deriving, let's think about derivation for a minute. As Melinda, so as Melinda Cooper has noted in discussing weather futures, contemporary markets have now produced derivatives that are literally producing value from betting on adverse and unpredictable events. There's, there's, a, there's lots of like great Deutsche Bank reports on like, you know, risks and potentials for climate change for investment. Um, uh, from betting on adverse and unpredictable events in relation to one another, rather than as discrete occurrences with lived impacts. So again, this kind of ability to assimilate 
uncertainty. As she says, with traditional derivatives contracts traded in the future prices of commodities, financial derivatives trade in futures of futures, turning promise itself into the means and ends of accumulation. Uh, time here is not does here becomes not a relationship to the spatial circulation of goods, labor, and commodity, but a thing in itself. A non-historical, but also non-geological or environmental time is a time of pure ecology of self-reference. The equation Cooper implies is somewhat new. She argues if before, at least since the 19th century, and we must consider the longer history of these algorithms since they initially emerged with the Dutch East India Company and the slave trade. And in fact, here we have to ask where genealogy might actually help us interrupt these sort of logics. Um, but since in the 19th century, the futures market bet on the change in price over time of a, com of a commodity. So here's the, if once we had time turns to money, now we have this new speculative fiction where money is just literally change in time. The form of time here is speculative, not predictive. This logic assumes physical form through engineering and design. Um, uh, in the production of test beds, demos, or prototypes, speculation on a future that is always multiple and elastic. Perhaps that's why we love the animation and re-narration of disaster and all these architectural projects, the constant reminder that change itself is a medium for speculation. If the Cold War was about nuclear testing and simulation as a mean to avoid the unthinkable, yet nonetheless predictable, the end is definitely coming, uh, the formula has now changed. This distinction is best summarized in the, dif in the difference that Frank Knight first made in the 20s between risk and uncertainty. Um, uncertainty, unlike risk, has no clearly defined endpoints or values, offers no clear cut terminal events. Its event structure is, is broken. What follows is that the test no longer serves as a simulation of life, but rather makes human life itself an experiment for technological futures. This uncertainty embeds itself in our technologies, both of architecture, design, and finance. Thus, in financial markets, we continually swap, derive, and leverage, never fully accounting for risks in the hope that circulation will defer any need to actually represent or confront it. And, um, and in infrastructure, engineering, and computing, we do the same. We prototype, develop, demo, version, whether in building management systems or creating smart infrastructure. So this leaves me with my final little equation and returns me to these kind of the situation that we're currently in and forces us to ask what, what other imaginaries or genealogies. So as part of contending or thinking about this condition, um, one of the things I want to think about, and I think other people have already discussed, are how do we produce different forms of temporality, different genealogies. For me as a historian, it becomes critical. I'm three seconds from the end. For me as a historian, um, I'm interested in also in how we can use old uh, particular genealogies to disrupt and also remind people about uh, where and how these technologies have developed. Um, I'm also interested in staying with the trouble and thinking about different practices, in this case, the Astor Gates um, Archive House Dorchester projects um, in uh, the south side of Chicago. Um, I also want to maybe learn from ecology itself. It's important to remember that uh, Holling himself argued that resilience does not equal optimization. Mm -hmm. You need to have diversity and plurality in a system in order for it to resolve. And I've been thinking with Annette Singh as well about what it means to care for our environments and understand different ways of envisioning how to encounter catastrophe. And I'll just end there. Great, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Orit, for this um, great talk. Are there any uh, immediate questions from public? No? Okay, now um, we come sort of to our second uh, part of the section, so we will have like uh, 30 to 40 minutes time for our respondents, and I will use the chance to shortly introduce them. So right next to me is uh, Georg Vrachliotis. He's a professor for the theory of architecture and the director of the Archive for Architecture and Engineering in Southwest Germany at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. He has been dealing in his research with the um, uh, cybernetic and uh, technocratic thinking in architecture in post-war period. has also been the curator of a recent exhibition on Frei Otto and now is also um, interested in datatopias. Uh, next to him, um, Bernd Scherer. So I don't really need to introduce him, director of the Haus der Kultur und der Welt. Great to have you in the discussion. And um, 
opposite of the table, uh, my colleague Jesko Feser, who is an architect and professor for experimental design at the Hochschule für Bildende Künste Hamburg and also founder of uh, Pro Quadratmeter Bookstore in Berlin. The bookstore. Hmm? What kind of bookstore? <laughs> the one. The, sorry, the bookstore. <coughs> one bookstore, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, um, I would like to open up the round. So um, it's not easy to um, uh, sort of bring together these very different <laughs> topics, starting from 3D additivism, dystopian future, <coughs> crazy tea parties, filmmaking, redistribution of privileged, uh, resilient hopes, and epistemologies of ignorance that we have been discussing so far in this round. But I'll give a try. Is there anybody of the three of you who would like to give a start? Yeah, I mean, I can, I, yes, I, I could thank start. you. First, I thought I, I, I have to, to ask you, uh, Morish, a question to your sticker, Never Lock Off, which is a very nice philosophy of today's um, discussion. But maybe <clears throat> there is, or I would, what would be interesting in, in another question, um, especially uh, after you talk, because you, you mentioned uh, Elon Musk and kind of the idea of fighting his idea of the fu of, of future. And uh, I was asking myself uh, a lot of times to what extent we need enemies to be productive, like in culture. And that would be one question to all of you, like the role of, of, of enemies uh, as a kind of, um, let's say, production machine to gain knowledge or to be critical or, or whatever you want to be. I mean, what, what is your personal and what is your general role of, 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 uh, of having enemies in culture? Mm. Well, I don't think having personal enemies would, you know, help in any productive way. But, but no, it's just, but really to go back to your point. I mean, you know, there's a whole discussion around whenever, like, you experience, um, like, a fascist government or, like, if you, like, grow up under, like, dictatorship, et cetera, you kind of like rebel against a lot of things, right? Maybe if you like grow up in a very like religious family, you turn to be like against that like very notion of everything that you were like forced to, to be or become, right? So I think there is something about this notion of recognizing that there is this, this other power that is trying to take over the world or like um, dispower you or, or, or in certain ways remove you and make you invisible, etc. And then to, for me, it's about recognition, recognition of, of those like spaces mm -hmm. and also kind of like critical thinking. It's, it's about like, why do you celebrate certain things? Why do you use technology? How do you use it? And mm -hmm. what does it mean to have access or not have access to something? But also, I think it's always, um, as an artist, like in my own practice, and I think also just on my daily life, I. I try to always like challenge comfort because I feel like it's always very dangerous when we can become very comfortable with certain certain position and perspective. You know, I mean, Elon Musk literally has a cult around him. Mm -hmm. I remember one time like leaving a comment under something on Facebook, uh, like you know, like giving shit to Elon Musk, and there were like all these like white men who came and like responded to this and they were like, it was like kind of like scary. I was like, oh wow, damn, I didn't like realize this is like, it's like this culty, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's that, it's not Elon Musk as a person, obviously, I'm, like, I'm mostly talking about the ideology, mm -hmm. right? Um, I talked uh, two days ago about invisibility and agency. And I think those two things are mm -hmm. what I really want to focus on when we think about futures and other future making and building. Um, yeah, so I, I leave you with that. And you yeah, never log off because you have to be online to fight this. So <laughs> I don't know, no, it's not related. It's just a post internet, you know, it became like really well known in this like, uh, and there was an article about it and then this became kind of like a position of younger kids who are always online. So mm -hmm. yeah, I stand by it, so. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah, I have uh, two questions or two points related to the knowledge concept uh, we are using uh, in this context of, um, yeah, of the technosphere, so to say. Uh, number one uh, is an observation uh, that um, designers in, in the last uh, decades started to really create realities 
And these realities are also deconstructive or disruptive to the realities as we have known them. As far as the humanities are concerned, basically the major methodological uh, approach is deconstruction. Mm -hmm. So we have a disbalance here on the one side of world creations by the natural sciences and designers, and on the other side, we have uh, the hum humanities, which are supposed to be concerned with the mind, but normally translate minds only in writings, books, and so on, and not in world making. Because the designers work with their mind to, do, to make realities. And I think the humanities did not, up to now, develop uh, conceptual instruments to deal with this situation. This is my first observation. The second observation relates a little bit to what uh, Orit has said. Uh, we have, uh, at the moment, uh, you may have noticed it, uh, a big conference on 1948. And uh, um, last night, uh, there was basically uh, two, three talks about biotechnology. And what was interesting to see in the context of biotechnology, but it relates also to the digital worlds, I would uh, uh, say, is that we have not only developed technologies of knowledge, but we have developed technologies to deal with black boxes. Mm -hmm. And the black box is uh, taking over to some extent. That means in the context of, for example, of biotechnology, that uh, there are experimentation and world creations where people are not anymore so much interested in knowing what is happening, mm -hmm. but in producing new worlds. So we are in a constant um, dynamic of producing without reflecting what the situation is we are producing. And this is quite different from the world's we used to know it before. I think it's very important. This is true uh, with relation to biotechnology, but I think it's also true uh, in, the, in the digital world because of the upscaling uh, by the algorithms where basically machines are creating knowledge and worlds. Um, we have not any more the conceptual means to um, define and uh, describe what is going on there. Mm. And I put it as an epistemological question, but of course, behind the epistemological question to know what's going on there is a much more broader question. How can we develop languages and conceptual means to open a, a discussion in society? How can we translate these uh, technological developments into the social sphere of discussions? And thereby, and this is my last point, what I can see, and I think this is really one of the crises of also at the moment uh, the, the Merkel uh, government is, um, we are depoliticizing the, the public sphere uh, by uh, means of governance, where the means of governance basically are delivering goods, but not opening up themselves into classical legitimation processes, what, what aims do we have, what objectives are we pursuing, mm -hmm. how do, do I legitimize these objectives. So I think this is a major point on the one side, the relation between knowledge, uh, criticism, um, and world making, mm -hmm. and on the other side, uh, to put this in a, a broader social political context uh, which uh, is questioning what kind of societies uh, we want to achieve. Sorry for... No, that's great. So, <laughs> I'm just wondering whether um, someone of uh, you would like to take up the question? Like or this, or is short, this is a short question and it's very interesting. Um, but does it mean that we need, uh, like if you say there's a speechlessness of, of uh, how to describe that kind of complex, uh, let's say, infrastructure or systems or, or, or governance processes? Like, do we need new theories in a sense of the good old intellectual one, or do we need a new use of, of media to, to uh, kind of process these theories? 
we are talking about. So is it a question of media or of, of, of theories? No, I, I would say the second one. Second I, one I, yeah. I think we uh, need a new, first of all, new means to navigate yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh, this situation. But uh, basically, I think we are using in the political social sphere a language of a world which does not anymore exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we are constantly creating uh, new worlds and uh, dynamisms. We have no means of representation, and, uh, or, pre or representation is not the right way, of uh, making available for a public discourse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a broader concept of representation, therefore I'm also using this uh, <laughs> concept. But uh, it's not uh, stabilizing the objects, mm -hmm. but I think uh, uh, instead of looking from above, this is gone, uh, and therefore the classical uh, uh, concept of representation is gone, uh, I think we need means of navigating these processes mm -hmm. in a reflexive way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Talk. Um, <laughs> yeah, you are not to talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, one of the things I, I mean, I agree. I think that essentially uh, across the board, but I don't just think it's in the humanities. I think it's in the science. I think it's even in design. Every day, people mm -hmm. are going obsolete and don't know what they're going to do tomorrow. Yeah. And I think it's really important to remind people that in general, there have been there's a constant kind of effort to reorganize, and that a lot of that is about you know, in some sense, attempting to deal with it, this condition in many ways, at least for me, is about staying with the trouble and maybe comes back to this enemy question, actually. I love my enemies. Um, uh, and actually, I'm, they're not even enemies. I actually don't mind um, oyster scape or um, an architect. And maybe like some of this is interesting to think with even as one might say, well, what would it mean to like push this aesthetic elsewhere where we would have to contend with the violence of the event for which this is being built, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, uncertainty is a tactic. Like, yeah. there's no getting out. There's, as uh, um, Sarah Sharma, I don't know if she's here, but you know, she writes all about exit fantasies and patriarchy. There's no outside. But you know, derivatives, for example, also create new forms of indebtedness. They tie us together in new ways that we have never been this closely tied. Something that happens in the housing market in one country will rapidly become mm -hmm. like a major global event. And one of the questions politically and ethically is how do we activate debt, that indebtedness, those forms of credit that merge us. But uncertainty is also a new form of tactic. Like, you know, I know right now in the fights against um, the now defunct Line 9, um, the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain uh, pipelines, um, uh, you know, many of the indigenous activists, you know, are start, we're starting to look at new um, tactics, like changing the bond rating of Canada, attempting to change risk valuation on some of these infrastructure projects. And I've talked about this uh, previously, I also used this as an example, but, um, these are all modes of attempting to, uh, you know, in many ways stay with the trouble, but just try to uh, understand how we can diversify or produce different forms of uncertainty um, that produce potentially different modes of relationality. And I think actually we had two examples here that speak really wonderfully about different practices that actually negotiated that. Mm -hmm. I thought. I was wondering um, what you said about uh, th that we need a um, new form of, I mean, representation knowledge of so or sort of mediating knowledge. I was uh, thinking very much uh, the work of Bruno Latour and uh, what he did in making things public and also uh, on his uh, essay, The Cautious Prometheus, where he sort of tried to define a new design theory uh, by finishing his text, um, where have been all the designer, engineers, uh, artists, uh, Whose primary, I mean, whose primary job was to make things visible in other ways. And I was always uh, wondering when I read this text, on the one hand, it feels very promising and tempting to uh, see designers, artists, uh, engineers as, the, um, yeah, as the, as the agents who really um, bring transformation as catalysts for transformation. And, and, but on the other hand, it also has this very ambivi ambivalent side uh, being within the context and logic of production and industrialization and digitalization. And this is something that, for example, Bruno Latour is not really explicitly referring to in his work. 
And yeah, I was just wondering, whenever the, the, the debate is uh, on how designers, artists, um, um, activists can sort of change or reshape technologies, there's also this um, backlash moment of being within the system. So maybe, Jesko, this is something you would like to respond to? Because I know it's a bit in your area of um, interest. I'm not sure if I can um, substantially contribute to this debate. Uh, so it was very exciting f uh, for me to, to listen to you and to try to follow up. But it's, as you said, it's really hard to kind of construct, um, from my perspective, um, a question that, um, that brings together the positions. But I mean, uh, what you, uh, in a way, proposed um, maybe is also an opportunity for me to bring it back a little bit to the sim simple question that is in the background. Um, maybe it's a designer's or a an, um, um, an designer's questions. So can we, how can we productively deal with the split, the historical split that we can in all kind of celebrate to a certain degree between some, something like an emancipatory perspective and something like a belief in technology. And we have an escalation of technology on ongoing um, for quite some time now, and uh, I think some deficits um, in our ability to think about emancipatory perspectives. Mm -hmm. And listening to you, it's more kind of a, uh, it's more kind of a question of where do we position ourselves in relation to to technology, whatever this is like. And, I ask myself, is the only possibility or the main or maybe most interesting possibility to look at technology as, let's say, observers, let's say as users or misusers or interprets or adapters or consumers? Um, I think this is a very important uh, perspective and I think, for example, um, with the issues of hacking, um, I think it has to do with this perspective. Um, there was also mentioned the co-producer uh, co as a consumer seems to be a little bit the same. It's one end, but uh, historically, I would say uh, technology was also something that was invented by designers, was con conceptualized, was a tool uh, to achieve a certain emancipatory perspective. Is this an option too to, to think about technology as something that we actively invent for some purposes, for some ideas of how to live together? And, and there's a third um, point about the relation that we have as designers or if, even if, um, as general as people to technic, um, that's the question of production. Um, technic is not only something that we can use, not only something we can invent, it's something that is produced. And we have seen the picture of the infrastructures, for example, <laughs> where also digital technology is produced. And this is a question of work. So what kind of work relation do we want to have to, technic, uh, to, to technology, the work relation of a kind of creative uh, person, uh, bureaucracy, or it's a, is it a kind of classical labor work um, or even kind of new kind of slavery? So I ask myself, so maybe we could, um, if you like, um, try to, to help me to, uh, to understand what kind of perspective do you think would be great or exciting to have to technology as a designer? Um, is it more this kind of watcher, user, misuser, interpreter? Or can we also be more active, more conceptualizing? And can we integrate to think about technique critically as workers? <coughs> this okay, question try. was meant to you mainly. Yeah. Actually, it's interesting for me, the discussion, because I came here thinking, okay, there is no that much difference between philosophy and design for me, because mm -hmm. after all, it's Karl Marx who says we have to change the world <laughs> and not just interpret it. So he's the proto-designer, let's say, even yeah. if he believes it's social processes that we need to, um, and some form of empowerment that we need to go through. And, um, and anyway, I was thinking like, okay, it's enough if we say uh, people need to get their hands on the infrastructure or on these means of production. And I'm happy to see some of the projects that represent that very well with the CCT cameras. When you give it back to the people, they do amazing things and they can turn the function of that technology into something unexpected or the 3D printers. They can create their messy apocalypses, which is something I really find like fascinating that it's not just them creating the solutions, but also having the say in the future and uh, showing uh, these dystopian futures that are also important in terms of creating enemies or mobilizing us in some ways. But actually, af after listening to 
Orit's presentation, I'm a bit worried that maybe the infrastructure and the tools of production that we need to take care of are not anymore technology, but it sounds it's like math. Yeah. Um, so it's this horrible yeah. formula that you showed about derivatives and this speculative, very mathematical way of uh, showing uncertainty and unpredictability as something that you can make a profit on that maybe a math is that DIY thing that, <laughs> that we need to do, but mm -hmm. that's just my immediate reaction that you disturbed me in some way, that <laughs> it's not enough just that I open my electronics and I'm able to make a circuit. Like, I actually don't know enough about math. Mm -hmm. yeah. Algorithm, yeah. <laughs> maybe, Ori, yeah. do you want to respond directly? Well, I, I mean, I think that there's a constant movement about what constitutes um, uh, um, what, what, like, there's a constant change about what constitutes technology or where the site of technical innovation is. And I think that's where a historical lens can make us, help us be like, well, yeah, maybe it's not about coding anymore. Now we've moved mm -hmm. to algorithms. Or, or now with da big data, it's actually about population and statistics and, and the kind of probability modes that mm -hmm. are incorporated inside um, finance. Uh, so, I mean, I think that it's not a matter of like frustration, it's just you got to stay with the trouble and you got to go where it's going in some sense. So mm -hmm. it just may mean, it means for us a constant need to be reflexive about our own practices in terms of what we're actually attempting to identify um, as the site of intervention. But it also constantly opens new opportunities as well. I mean, and speaking of, I mean, I don't know enough, but you know, it, it does open up certain questions about like blockchain and, and these new financial infrastructures and what they're mm -hmm. going to look at and what, how they're going to be organized. I mean, so mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if that's an answer. Uh, yeah, just one remark to your math uh, observation. Uh, I think it's, it's not only functioning in the context of, of finance markets. Um, yesterday, and that was really new for me, uh, when these uh, biological engineers were speaking about their kind of technologies, they said the major thing to technologize uh, a biological process is to have a mathematical model. If you don't have a mathematical uh, model, you cannot, so to say, engineer it. So it, it's really uh, even, let's say, in the kind of organic uh, life uh, business, uh, mathematics uh, plays now a, a major role. And uh, I would really subscribe that the major driver of everything is mathematics. But perhaps we open up. Huh? Yeah, I also <laughs> was wondering whether we can uh, open up the discussion. There might no, be no. some uh, questions. True. Yeah, I've seen the question okay, already. Right. So we're, the micro is also there. Thanks. Thanks for the nice discussion um, for the last part about mathematics and these things, blockchain, uh, getting control of infrastructure. I think the major problem that we will get and that we already see is that we uh, have to learn how we have to discuss with each other and not about like the technology. I think blockchain especially is something like it's, it's, there are so ridiculous stories going up there, like about these communities that are developing this and like, I mean, the major issue that we have is like, like we see already with some examples here that we are able to get this control on infrastructure like with 3D printing or like the CCTV camera and these things. And the major thing is then on how we are able to discuss, I think, as a, as a society. Mm -hmm. uh, a remark, I think. I'm yes. not sure if I have a question. I just <laughs> want to, to, to add to, to, you know, we need to like our enemies. And I just, when, when, when Claudia mentioned uh, Latour, I was reminded of the, the preface to Aramis. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and the love of technology or the love of technology where he says that we, for, for far too long, uh, the philosophers and the mm. artists are not working yes. with the hard sciences and with mm. the engineers. Mm. Yes. And maybe the maths is a very abstract, but I think where we can enter, we need to. Yes. And you know, mm. you're a collaborator when you work with your enemy, yes. right? I mean, just mm. even That's very much. Oh, yeah. So yes. wherever we can, stay mm. with it, mm. stay with the trouble and... Yeah. and, uh, and I, can I add yes. to that? And I, I would say that it's, it's that, like, how do we bring all these disciplines together? Um, but also, this is, uh, you know, it's, again, it, it comes down to, like, how do you also bring all these, like, thinking um, 
talking ideas, mm. etc., to real life. This is something mm. I like briefly talked about the other day. But I think for me that has always been the challenge um, that like this this disconnection from you know whether it's academia or whether like you're like teaching in a school that you have like certain access or resources as a certain class of people or group of people too, mm -hmm. right? So um, I taught um, a course this last semester at the School for Poetic Computation in New York and um, the whole, it was called the Radical Outside Critical Thinking of Technology and the whole goal of the class was to build a library of the history and the story of technology written by uh, people of color, LGBT community, etc., etc. Um, and it was very challenging, obviously, mm -hmm. to gather information, mm -hmm. to build this library because it's so non-existent. Mm -hmm. But um, we managed to also like gather a lot of this material that are not written by or like a certain kind of like philosophy or thinking about technology. Or again, it's history being told, which has always been like very linear. Um, and if we are talking about progress and changing this notion of progress, I think these are small ways that we can like really help reshape this very binary thinking of technology, which is, um, as you all mentioned, it's like very Western and like it comes from a very specific uh, point of view to the world and, and everything around us. Um, so that library is online now. It's it's actually accessible on GitHub and. You know, I think for me personally, one of the things as an educator, my goal is to build this library that is not being used, that doesn't exist really in like universities and different organizations um, as main material to talk about technology. Um, yeah, so how, how can we, I guess my question is that, how can we practically have this influence on like a daily basis as, as creators and educators and um, yeah, thinkers? I mean, for starters, pedagogy can, is a political act. Yes. <laughs> like, I, I do take my pedagogy probably is the central and most important thing I do. Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of like actual <coughs> doing, doing, um, and perhaps in that sense, it's a political act to rethink the question of making itself and and how tightly we've limited what we think it constitutes to make. Um, you know, otherwise we're talking about. Uh, we're also talking about institutional design and creating different spaces and, um, and asking new forms of questions mm -hmm. that are going to demand the kind of integration between these disciplines. So. I was uh, just thinking, uh, you know, um, what has been said about mathematics and that we need to um, learn more mathematics and be more familiar with algorithms. And at the same time, you could also say that, I mean, saying this, this also would fulfill or force us into a new um, kind of functionalism by only solving problems through, through the lens of mathematics, like more geometrico. At the same time, we also need, like, what you're presenting, like alternative genealogies of this history. So, of course, maybe everything is now shaped through mathematics, but this is not the only explanation. And what alternative genealogies of um, the rise of te certain technologies or certain interrelations of uh, spaces of technology and knowledge production can give us is also alternative ways of redeveloping technology. I guess in, in that kind, history is maybe the, mo the most important tool of design as well. In terms of, I'm sorry, just to clarify yes. the genealogy because it's very interesting in, t in terms of probability and statistics. Yeah. Um, so. The way it was developed originally was to regulate population. Mm -hmm. And one yep. of the first studies were like um, uh, statistics of suicides, where they found out yep. what you mm -hmm. also mentioned, that in, in every population there is a certain percent of suicides, and you should basically not deal with that. It just happens. Mm -hmm. So you let the system dissipate because yep. it will be operational. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I think that you're right about the genealogy as being important in terms of uh, responding to this challenge of math mm -hmm. defining all other pa practices today. Uh, uh, one point to mathematics. I just want to say how important mathematics yeah. is, not that it no, is I the answer uh, to, to, to everything, number one. Uh, but the second point I, I think is even more important is your history point and yeah. also uh, what Ori said. Uh, and there, what is, from my perspective, most important is what concept of history we have. Yeah. Because uh, we are living in a time where because of these fast transformations, we, we uh, experience a kind of historization um, 
uh, on the one hand, but what we need is to look at history as a kind of space of possibilities. Mm -hmm so that it becomes, so to say, a, a support of agency yeah. and not of looking back and yeah. uh, a kind of uh, new restoration yes. process. Yes. Because that is basically taking place. Yes. It's not using history in the sense, um, and that is exactly the, at the core of our 100 Years of Now project, is uh, that the history provides a space to rethink developments which are um, defining our life today in new ways. And this is also what you meant. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. Okay, maybe I take this as a finishing. Yeah, we have to. Well, there's yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, a question. Oh, there's a question, but okay. Well, okay. Oh, wait. No. Just before you, you, uh, you ask your question, I will just uh, say that uh, after this question, we have to close completely okay. because we are, we are tight, but keep all the questions for later. Because on the last panel, we discussed again the two yeah. topics in the two tables. So it's not, your questions are not lost. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Is it on? Okay, hello and um, thank you. Um, one um, um, uh, thing, because Bauhaus might be dead, is because Bauhaus concentrated uh, on students, on older people. And we're um, speaking about um, having a new world, a new man, but uh, science proves that Kinder, like children, kindergartens, this age is uh, very important and uh, crucial to, uh, or let's say education is very important. So is the solution, and regarding technology competences, media competences, math, to create a kind of uh, Bauhaus connected kindergartens, um, like uh, s schools, um, in a way to educate uh, children in this new world? Because, um, um, we are we are here 20 uh, in the 20s in the 30s in the 40s and dealing with with this uh, with this um, concepts but it's very crucial to educate uh, children also um, to survive in this new world so yeah that's my question okay. maybe it's uh, interesting to know that Bauhaus itself was uh, inspired by kindergarten at the time mm -hmm. so I mean, that's maybe where the cycles go together but just two, two short very yeah. short comments I and I know that, that at the, uh, the history of Media Lab or at MIT in Boston, there, there were always that kind of approaches like lifelong learning or that kind of playing with the, with the robot turtles and Walter Gray. So the idea is, is uh, quite, quite common, I think, to start at a very early point. But I just want to mention to bridge a little bit the wonderful talk we had in the morning um, by Fred, 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 Fred's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, talk and the discussion here. Um, I missed one thing, and that is a little bit the the uh, the, um, the historical role of HFG Ulm, mm -hmm. which which Max Bill, who who was the first director of of HFG Ulm, uh, at the very beginning of the institution, wrote to to Walter Gropius that he wanted to name uh, the he wanted to choose the the label. Um, Bauhaus Ulm. Mm -hmm. So they, they want to recreate, they want to recreate the Bauhaus in Ulm. And just for the, for yeah. the upcoming discussion or for later, that we have to include that, that kind of um, history part, speaking about the HFG Ulm and all that mm -hmm. wonderful uh, theories or, or designers uh, in, in post-war Ulm. Yeah. But maybe there will be a next anniversary <laughs> to, <laughs> to discuss. But I mean, we leave it More from here. And uh, uh, thank you very much yeah. for uh, <laughs> your inputs <laughs> and um, your engagement in the discussion, for having you here. Thank you. <laughs>